Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, allow me first of all to join my colleagues on this side of the house to congratulate Dr. Ashni Singh and the Ministry of Finance team for putting together a balanced budget. This budget takes into consideration the need to repair the damage done by APNU AFC by unshackling the poor from the unconscionable taxes, by restoring and expanding jobs, and laying the blueprint for prosperity in this country. Mr. Speaker, the people are relieved that the economy is back in safe hands, that the budget represents their interests, that they were consulted, and that their views were incorporated, and because of this, that they have more monies now in their pockets for themselves and their family. Mr. Speaker, we just heard an excursion into fiction. We heard from the honorable member who came before us just now that somehow that we heard cassava was increased by a thousand percent and banana and bora and plantain and pineapple and somehow these increases while laudable as they are, somehow they would replace our export earning in sugar and rice. How much cassava did we export? How much money did we earn? How much pineapple did we export? And how much did we earn? When you come here and you try to tell us about agriculture, your record in agriculture is disgraceful. And every single farmer in this country knows that. So don't come here and lecture us. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about agriculture a little bit. What have they done with the infrastructure in agriculture? What have they done with the DNI of this country? They have increased the charges on farmers. They took it up to $15,000 per acre when under the PPP it was $3,500. And because of that, farmers were leaving the lands in droves. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, what about VAT on agriculture? What about VAT on agriculture? Let's talk about it. 14% VAT on agricultural inputs. That is what they impose. And you know what that caused? That caused simple farmers not to be able to have the inputs to be able to do proper agriculture. Imagine, Mr. Speaker, they put VAT on spray can so that the farmers could not have or paid more for spray cans. And what about the markets for these agricultural produce? Where are the markets? Under the APNU AFC, they had no markets for the farmers, causing whatever they produce, in many cases, to spoil. Mr. Speaker, I had the opportunity of going in Region 9, and when I visited some of those villages, the peanut farmers could not have access to market. Now, under this government, Region 9 farmers can have access to market. What about agro-processing? We left a beautiful, functioning agro-processing facility at Parika. State of the art. What did they do with it over the last couple of years? 
they have abandoned that facility. And that is why we are going to restore that. And not only that, we are going to be building more agro-processing facility for our farmers in Region 3, Region 9, Region 10, and Region 6. Mr. Speaker, in every sector we can look at what they have done. They have destroyed almost every sector of our country. And Honourable, they come Honourable here... Minister, I just want to understand who they are. The Honourable Member on that side. They are PNU AFC. They have destroyed almost all sectors of our economy. And they come here today to lecture us. Mr. Speaker, gone are the years when with every passing up to AFC budget, anxiety turned into nightmares as working families were buried deeper under taxes and thousands of jobs were destroyed. And let them say they didn't destroy jobs. Look at what happened in sugar. More than 7,000 jobs. More than 7,000 families there retrenched. And that had an indirect impact on many communities across this country. And then let's look at the other sector. Under their watch, they lost more than 33,000 jobs. And that is a report from their own Ministry of Labor. And we can count so thousands of jobs were destroyed. And there was a sense of hopelessness that pervade this land. Mr. Speaker, what this budget is trying to do is to right the wrongs against the poor of our country by creating job opportunities, by removing VAT on essential food items, by restoring dignity and giving everyone a fair shot at prosperity. Mr. Speaker, this is not empty rhetoric. Ask the sugar workers, ask the construction workers, ask the small business owners, ask the mining workers, ask the public servants, ask the police and the army, ask the elderly, and ask the working families of this country. Every family in this country today, Mr. Speaker, is happy with the restoration and the increase of the cash grant of 15,000 per child. Every household is satisfied with the COVID-19 cash grants of $25,000. What did they do for the people? They were there. Why is it that they couldn't give them a cash grant for COVID? Mr. Speaker, in this country today, there's a feeling of optimism. There's a renewed sense of confidence. And Mr. Speaker, everybody is talking that Guyana is back on track. Mr. Speaker, despite their toxic, their, their toxic bombast, the, the persons on the other side, the honorable members. Even these honorable members, they know that this is an excellent budget. With the right balance of social expenditures and physical measures, and this mix is going to make a bigger pie for all Guyana. Perhaps that is why, Mr. Speaker, there were no arguments on the macro or even the micro economic measures. There was no views on the economic fundamentals of this budget. And there weren't any ideas on the budget measures. Instead, the honorable members were very comfortable taking refuge in dishonorable, distasteful, racist rants. I heard one honorable member refer to another honorable member, 
as an Uncle Tom. And there were many others that litter this debate. Mr. Speaker, this speaks volumes about the person that is making the attacks and speak even more about the racist nature of the organization that they represent. I hope that when the Honorable Leader of the Opposition rises to make his contribution, that he rebukes his offending comrades, condemns in the, in the strongest terms this racist tirade, and offer an apology to the members of this House and the Guyanese people as a whole. Mr. Speaker, this type of backward thinking has no place in a forward-looking Guyana. Michelle Obama once said, when someone is cruel or acts like a bully, you don't stoop to their level. No, our motto is when they go low, we go high. Throughout Honorable this debate, Honorable Member, Ms. McDonald, certain words you're using, Mr. Mahi Paul and your colleague, the Honorable Member, when you shout, you're right in my ear. Continue, Honorable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Throughout this debate, we have taken the high ground highlighting policies, plans, and the pathways to prosperity. In contrast, our opponents have valiantly tried to distract attention away from the pro-people, pro-business measures in this budget. This ostrich-like behavior of burying your heads in the sand so that you are blinded to the obvious is a hallmark of soul, sore losers. Look up, look around you. The country has moved on. The, poop, the people are moving on. Many of them feel betrayed by their leaders, false narratives, the ugly attempts to subvert the constitution, the bizarre attempts to mingle the elections. The Honorable Member Roysdale Ford was part of that star-studded cast of lawyers who desperately tried every trick in the book to thwart the will of the Guyanese people. The people of this country, Mr. Speaker, will never forget the Honorable Member and his colleagues handiwork to stop the legitimately passed no confidence motion. They knew that the no confidence motion was passed with a legal majority and they said so in the Parliament. Yet he joined in arguing all the way to the CCJ to stop the effect of the no confidence motion using convoluted mathematics. Mr. Speaker, the people of this country will never forget the Honorable Member defense of one Clement Mingo who sought to alter the statements of poll. Honorable Minister, there is a standing order with respect to naming people who can defend themselves in the House, so please. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Member defended the Prince of Ashman's building who sought to alter the statements of poll. Mr. Speaker, the people of this country would never forget the Honorable Member and his colleagues support 
for I don't know if to call his name now. The one who arbitrarily threw out tens of thousands of votes so that he could change the winner of the March 2nd election. And we all know who he is because he submitted many reports. Well, you call it. Exactly. Mr. Speaker, the people of this country would never forget the Honorable Member tried and call for a total forensic count to determine the election's final results. Yet he then turned around after the reconk results showed that the PVP won the elections and challenged these results in court. Mr. Speaker, how can the people of this country forget the Honorable Member and his colleagues after he was instrumental in delaying the legitimate government from taking office for more than five months. These are the same honorable members who came to this parliament and I heard in his opening statement he said he reject, he oppose and he renounce this budget. What? What can this honorable member come to this parliament after all that he has done with these election petitions and all kinds of things to challenge the legitimacy of budget 2021? Mr. Speaker, the Guyanese people are smart, they are resilient, and they are strong. And even those who voted for Abdu AFC realized that they were taken for a ride. Many of your supporters listen with amazement at the flip-flopping and the inconsistencies. And many of them concluded that you lost the elections when you refused to produce your SOPs. Not only have you lost the elections, you have now lost credibility. People don't believe you. People don't trust you. People are ashamed of you. That is why people are keeping their social distance from you. The trick that you once pull of using ethnic mobilization to sustain support is changing. Guyanese no longer want to live in ethnic enclaves. They are tired of hearing you single out one group over another. And I know many of you are gifted with words. You can dress up your racism in nice flowery language. But when we strip the fanciness away, it is pure ethnic hustle. This must stop. Mr. Speaker, on the eve of the election anniversary, I want to say that the Guyanese people have moved on. They want the APNU AFC to accept the results of the elections and move on. They want us to erase the lines of division. They want us to have more unity and cooperation. We must work to make that wish a reality. We must actively work and continuously promote the many things that can make, that can help make Guyana and knit Guyana into that diverse tapestry. Our people will always be at their best when we rise above division and ethnic cleavages. When our brothers and sisters can come together for a common purpose to proclaim the creed in our motto of one people, one nation, with one destiny. Mr. Speaker, our President, His Excellency, 
Mohammed Irfan Ali understands the value of unity and the cost of division. That is why he created the One Guyana Commission to bring our people together. Whether we are big or small, whether we are black or brown, government or opposition, there is an opportunity for everyone. This is a vision of hope, of oneness, of a new Guyana that we are building. We need every Guyanese talents and efforts in rebuilding and creating new levels of prosperity. We need them in every sector of our country. Mr. Speaker, in health, we are still battling with many challenges in this sector. And this includes drug shortages, lack of adequate infrastructure, lack of ambulances. These problems are systemic. And while some progress has been made, it would require a lot more work to permanently correct the deficiencies and the damage done by the APNU and AFC. In terms of drug shortages, we have inherited a messy situation where drugs and medical supplies were not purchased since 2018. And more than one billion worth of drugs in the bond had expired. We had to dump this. We had to start to address this shortage by doing emergency procurement to fill the immediate needs. And we are hopeful that with this year's allocation of more than $7 billion, that we will stabilize this situation. Mr. Speaker, APNU AFC left us with many incomplete infrastructural projects. The most famous is the Infectious Disease Hospital, where they spent $1 billion. Yet, it was inoperable. Our government had to fix all the deficiencies, buy all the equipment, and find the staff to run the facility. We had to make it operable. And Mr. Speaker, despite all of those challenges, we were able to start the services at that facility on the 1st of September, 2020. And to date, Mr. Speaker, we have treated close to 700 patients in that facility. Mr. Speaker, there are many other incomplete projects, including the Rheinfeld Polyclinic and the Ministry of Health Head Office. The Honorable Dr. Cummins said that she would be monitoring in our speech earlier in this debate. And it begs the question of why did she not monitor before? because the projects are substantially delayed and above budget. Mr. Speaker, let's just look at the Ministry of Health headquarters. This is a clear case of mismanagement and, if not possible, corruption. This project, which was started in 2017, at the cost of $365 million, and was to be completed in 365 days is still not finished. The contractor was paid 304 million, which represented 85% of the contract sum. And of that sum that was paid, 233 million was paid without any valuation certificates. To complete this project now, Mr. Speaker, we will have to plaster the walls. We have to fix the ceilings, do internal and external painting, installation of a lift, build some stairs, tiling, plumbing, and electrical works. Yet, 85% of the money 
has already been expended. The contractor, Mr. Speaker, has since been terminated and a new tender for a contractor to finish the job will shortly... The contractor shortly. has been terminated? The contract, the contract has been terminated, sorry. And we have advertised, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, APNU AFC were also in the habit of announcing infrastructural projects and don't follow through, budget after budget. And here is a clear example. Since 2016, the APNU AFC spoke about the primary health care project. And every year since then, they have made a token allocation in the budget, but the project never materialized. In 2017, there was nothing. 2018, nothing. 2019, nothing. In 2020, when we returned to office, we realized that no work was done on this project for all these years. And within months, Mr. Speaker, we were able to restart the negotiations with the Exim Bank of India. Tenders were advertised. Firms were allowed to bid, and they were evaluated. And the recommendation was made for a company to do the designs of the West Demerara Hospital, the Saudi Hospital, and the Bartika Hospital. Those designs work, those design works would start in a few months, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when they were in office, and I mean the APNU AFC, many of the governments did not trust them with the money because the Smart Hospital Project, a UK government initiative, instead of the traditional practice to give the government of the day the money so that they can administer the project, the UK government passed those monies to PAHO WHO for implementation. And it shows the confidence that they had in that government. And so, Mr. Speaker, under the Smart Hospital Project, we have already completed the Diamond Hospital, which we will reopen sometime later this month. And Mr. Speaker, we are also going to work and try to finish the other hospitals, which include Lenora, Mabaruma, and Latem hospitals. And we are also going to complete the health center at Paramakutai. This is what progress looks like, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in improving the well-being of mothers, we expect to strengthen the maternity infrastructure across this country. A new maternity home will be opened within months at Lethem. And we are also going to improve and open a new maternity ward at the New Amsterdam Hospital later in this year. And we are also going to build maternity waiting homes at Cato and Maruka. And yes, Mr. Speaker, we had a very unfortunate death at the New Amsterdam Hospital. And already, Mr. Speaker, we have sent an investigation team and they went there yesterday and they have completed an investigation and when I get those recommendations, we will take actions against the nurses and the doctors and whoever is at fault in that unfortunate death. Mr. Speaker, in the past, we had a very successful pediatric cardiac program at the Georgetown Public Hospital. And we were able to do more than 100 cases at the hospital. This program that would normally help the children of this country was dismantled 
by this government. And over the past two years, Mr. Speaker, we were only able to spend, send about five children for cardiac care abroad. And for each child that we have to send to Canada or the US to operate, to get their operations, it would cost about 30 to 50,000 US dollars. They sent in the last two years five children. One went to the US and three went to, Canada, uh, to Cuba. There's a backlog of cases and a preliminary analysis, Mr. Speaker, would show that we have nearly 130 children waiting for surgery. That is why, Mr. Speaker, in this year's budget, we have allocated monies to buy all the necessary equipment and to pay the surgeons to come back to Guyana so that we can restart the pediatric cardiology program. So that you can restart your presentation, you'll need an extension. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask for the Honourable Member to be given five minutes to conclude his Thank you, excellent Honourable presentation. Member. Thank you, Honourable Member, Mr. Shearer. Honourable Minister, you may continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker, there are many, many other things that I can talk about. We can talk about the successes that we are getting in terms of reducing the burden of infectious diseases. We can talk about the work that we have started doing in chronic non-communicable diseases, which also include developing a new oncology program so that we can treat those patients. Mr. Speaker, you know, within these couple months, we have, been, we have been able to work with a team in the ministry and with our external stakeholders to put together a new vision, a new strategy for health in Guyana that goes from 2021 to 2030. And not only that, Mr. Speaker, we have completed a new HIV plan. And in that plan, we are going to roll out comprehensive PrEP. And we are also going to do self-testing. And I can go on and on with the many things that we have done and that we will be doing. But Mr. Speaker, since there have been a clamor for me to talk about COVID-19, I'll now turn my attention to COVID-19. We have heard many of the speakers here, the honorable members on the other side, they came here and they said that we on this side did not have a plan for COVID-19. And if you examine what they did after our first case on the 11th of March, 2020, if they were so effective and if they had such a good plan, then after we had the first case and the first death, then they would have been able to do all the contact tracing and we would have liquidated COVID-19 from Guyana. But the truth was that they were in shambles. They didn't know what to do. And so they were scrambling for a response. They were not able to do PCR testing. And so we had to build capacity in almost every area for the response. But now that we have completed that, we're now moving to the next, the next stage of this response. And the next stage has to be the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we were very grateful to the Prime Minister of Barbados and the people of Barbados for sending us 3,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And as soon as we got it, the next day we were able to start rolling that out to our frontline health workers. And we have immunized workers 
in region 4, 3, 2, 6, 5, 8, 9, and 1, and 7. All over we spread it out. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? Tomorrow morning, we'll be getting 20,000 more vaccines that are coming in, and we'll be using that to immunize our workers. And on the 8th, on the 8th of March, International Women's Day, we'll be getting 80,000 more vaccines for the people of this country. And later in the month, we'll be getting another 100,000 through the COVAX mechanism so that we can immunize our population. Mr. Speaker, if this is not a plan, then what else is a plan? This is what is going to get us out of COVID-19. And I want to thank the government of India, the government of China, the government of Barbados and COVAX for providing us with vaccine so that we can protect the people of this country. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker.